Hello and welcome back to another episode of Hollywood Wargaming. Today we are returning to our bolt action unit guide with the forward air observer. Now I apologize, I was planning on recording this a few days ago, but I looked at my calendar and I realized it was a wildly inappropriate date for such a topic. And admittedly, it's probably not my most favorite thing to talk about, but I have a few beverages in my system and the time is come. We are going to discuss the forward air observer in bolt action. And before we really dive into this, I just want to have a bit of a talk and a disclaimer. It may sound like I've been really down on bolt action lately, but just know that this is probably my most played war game of the last few years. And when you spend that much time with one rule system, you really start to pick out the problems with it and really kind of hone in on them. And they kind of start to scratch at you more than they would otherwise when you're alternating between different game systems or just playing it less frequently. So overall, I want to emphasize that my gripes with Bolt Action's rule system are minor, but there are a few glaring issues with certain units and certain sub-rules within the game that don't always come up. And overall, I really do like Warlord games. I love Bolt Action. I love its rule system. But uh, this video is on a unit that is probably the absolute low point of this game. One that is pretty much, in my opinion, the poster child of how not to write rules for a war game. So I'm really going to just unleash on it here. Fortunately, that being said, it's not the most commonly fielded unit in Bolt Action. In fact, I'd say it's one of the rarest you'll see. And there's reasons for that. So while I am going to hammer the hell out of this unit and the rules how it's written, uh, know that it's something that's not really a pillar of bolt action and it's not going to come up all the time. So overall, it's not really that big of a blemish on bolt action as a rule set or game. But to sum it up a bit, it is my problem with flamethrower is pretty much dialed up to 11. So what do you get when you bring a forward air observer to the table? Well, basically you have an officer on the field who represents a, well, forward air observer who's going to call in airstrikes onto an enemy target instead of, uh, let's say, artillery strikes like we viewed in our last video. So much like the artillery officer representing an entire battery of guns who are not existent on the tabletop, you are now going to have a little guy with a radio or binoculars representing an airplane. And this guy is going to be taking up that uh, forward observer slot in your reinforced platoon, which is not very highly competed for. Pretty much it's just him and the forward air observer, with some scenarios having things like naval observers. So it's a kind of a vacant slot most of the time. So fitting him into your reinforced platoon isn't really a problem, which I guess you could say is a plus. And this will be one model coming in at 75 points for regular veterancy or veteran for 90, which is a significant 25 points cheaper than the forward artillery observer. And much like his artillery counterpart, he can be accompanied by up to two extra models with him coming in at 10 points for regular or 13 points per veteran. And the observer and his extra cronies can be equipped with either a rifle, some machine gun or pistol as you wish. And in theory, you could give him those two cronies, and then after he uses up his airstrike, he could yeet up the board and maybe charge someone in melee or try and tie up an objective. But as we all know, if you go from two to three guys, you will lose that small team hard-to-hit bonus, which is quite nice. And much like his artillery counterpart, I would say that most of the time equipping those extra guys on here is pretty much just throwing points away. You're taking this top heavy unit to call on that airstrike and not really do anything else. Putting points in him with the assumption that you're going to do something else with him is kind of pointless. But let's say you're playing like a really awkward like 750 or 500 point game and then you could get a three man submachine gun squad or something like that. I don't know. Uh, maybe it could work, but it, like I said, not ideal. But for the most part, this guy is going to be able to sit extremely far away, hopefully safe from sniper fire and call in his airstrike, and he will want to take advantage of that extreme range. But with no further ado, we are going to take a look at the airstrike ability itself. And uh, funnily enough, when you go to the forward air observer section in the uh, headquarters part of the official rulebook, second edition, one of the first things it says is that this forward air observer can be accompanied by an assistant radio operator. But if you go to the back of the rule book, it says one to two guys with rifles or SMGs, nothing about an additional radio operator. So, and that's just some classic tabletop rule scub right there. However, when activated and given a fire order, this unit can select one enemy unit that it has line of sight on anywhere on the battlefield. And said unit then becomes the target of an airstrike. 
And much like the Artillery Observer, you will then, at the beginning of each following turn, roll a d6 and then consult the following chart to see what happens with said airstrike, with the results of the chart being as follows. On a d6 roll of 1, you will get a rookie pilot. This inexperienced airman has trouble with target recognition, and the opposing player can now actually choose one of your units to put the marker on, and you then proceed to resolve the attack on your own units. Now, right off the bat, you have a pretty big problem here. This roll of one is a hell of a lot worse than the miscalculation on the artillery barrage, where it pretty much scatters in 3d6 direction. This just straight up allows your opponent to choose one of your targets, and now all of a sudden your 75-point unit is actually your opponent's free 75-point unit hitting you with your own ability. And in a few moments, we're going to take a look at what those attacks actually look like. Now, on a roll of two or three, you are going to get Skies Are Empty, and this is pretty much the same as the Artillery Barrage's Delay, where nothing's going to happen for this turn, and you will instead roll at the beginning of next turn to see what happens. Now, it is worth noting that even if your Forward Air Observer is killed in between this time, so long as he's called it in, you will continually roll until something happens. So, if you roll a Skies Are Empty on a two or three, and then let's say a Sniper kills your Air Observer, you still are going to roll next turn to see what happens with this chart. Uh, you're not off the hook yet, for better or worse. However, on a roll of 4, 5, or 6, it is going to be a here it comes result, which means the airplane is coming in right on your enemy target. And it is worth noting that this is going to follow the enemy unit around wherever it is, whether it goes out of line of sight or anything like that. As long as the air observer could mark it on its first turn with a fire order in line of sight, it's pretty much stuck on that unit like glue unless you roll a 1. So what exactly happens when this plane is incoming? Is it a Spitfire coming in for a strafing run? Maybe something with rockets? Is it a Stuka doing a dive bomb? Uh, well, no, you don't actually know. It's just a plane that you roll on a chart for to see what it is. So after the plane actually comes in, you're then going to roll another d6 and consult the warplane type chart. Now I'll go ahead and say this up front. Pretty much any result here is going to count against the top armor of a vehicle, should that be its target. I mean, it makes sense. It's coming in from the air, which will, of course, confer an additional plus one penetration value to the roll, which will, of course, be relevant for all of our hits here. And also, all units within 6 inches of the intended target are going to potentially receive pins here, as they are becoming suppressed by the incoming fire. So you are going to be rolling a d3 for the intended target, and all units, friendly or enemy, within 6 inches of said target, and then subtracting 1 from the result of that d3 roll, meaning all of these units are going to receive somewhere between 0 and 2 pins, regardless of what type of plane is actually coming in. So once that pinning is worked out, you are now going to roll on that warplane type chart, and on a 1 or 2, you are going to be getting a strafing fighter. This is going to be something simpler, like maybe a Spitfire coming in with its machine guns and strafing the area. And with this, the original target is going to be taking one additional pin on top of whatever pins you rolled earlier. And infantry, artillery, and soft skin vehicles are going to suffer 2d6 hits with a plus 2 penetration value with infantry and artillery having the ability to go down to mitigate the incoming hits in half, same way as you would with a high explosive shell, although this is something you have to do before the dice are rolled, and any armored targets count as being hit on their top armor. And here I want to take a moment to point out how bad the rules writing can be in bolt action sometimes, because straight up right here it does not say anything about armored targets receiving hits. It says, infantry, artillery, and soft skin vehicles suffer 2d6 hits with a plus 2 pen value. It says nothing about the amount of hits that armored vehicles will suffer, let alone a pen value. Because plus 2 penetration against the top armor of a vehicle is actually pretty powerful. Let's say you have something like a Bren carrier or an SDKFC-222 with the open top special rule, which is going to confer an additional plus 1 penetration against its top armor. If you're to infer that this thing is getting 2d6 hits with a plus 2 penetration value, you're basically getting hit with 2d6 light anti-tank shots. Now, okay, yes, maybe a plane should be able to destroy an open-top vehicle relatively easily, even if it's just coming in with machine gun fire. That's arguable, that's fine. But it does highlight another major problem with Bolt Action's rule system, where vehicle point values do not scale on a percentage base. Instead, there's just a static points plus or minus based on special rules they have. 
And believe it or not, the open top special rule is only going to get you minus five points on a vehicle, be it a 95 point SDKFC 222 or a 200 to 300 point tank like an M10 tank destroyer or Ostwind. Oh, and by the way, that Pinto Mountain machine gun you bought on your Tiger tank, if you use that this turn, guess what? Your vehicle's open top. So already you're starting to see how many moving parts and variables you have to not only consider, but frickin' just remember in order for this airstrike to work out. And believe it or not, the uh, strafing fighter is my favorite part about this entire unit. Uh, if you get a roll of two or four, you know, I'm not even going to delete that and redo that. I'm looking at my rule book right in front of me, second edition. Uh, roll of two or four, not three or four. One or two is the strafing fighter. And here we have a typo that says on a roll of two or four, which I'm is supposed to be 100% a roll of three or four, uh, you're supposed to get a fighter bomber in. But there you go. And another thing, the, it, it's funny. Everything wrong with bolt action comes out in this unit, even just the typos in the rule book. So they just come out with the air observer. If you guys have the second edition rule book at hand, pop it open and see if you have that same typo too. It's 100% supposed to be a roll of three or four. A fighter bomber comes in. Now a fighter bomber is something more akin like a uh, Stuka dive bomber. And here, the original intended target is going to take an additional D2 pin markers on top of that original pinning strafe. And you are going to place a 3-inch high explosive template on the target. And this, of course, is going to have a plus 3 penetration value, meaning you're going to get a plus 4 penetration value on the top armor of vehicles. And a plus 5 if that vehicle does count as open-topped. And much like any other HE, infantry units can go down to half the number of uh, incoming attacks here. But this will be giving you a superficial hit on medium armor on a roll of 5 and a penetrating hit on a roll of 6. Of course, that is going to be a plus 1 to both those rolls if you are a light vehicle. And if you're a tank it, you're going to be having a really bad time here as they are going to be glancing you on a roll of 3 and penetrating you on a roll of 4 or 5 with an overpen on a roll of 6. But at the very least, that vehicle is going to be taking somewhere between one to four pins. So even if this does end up bouncing off of a Tiger, it is going to still put it out of action for a turn while it has to rally, at least in most averaging scenarios. But lastly, on a roll of two or six, no, nah, I'm just kidding. It says five or six. It's proper. On a roll of five or six, you are going to get a ground attack aircraft, which I believe is going to be something more along the lines of maybe a, a Lancaster uh, I'm not a big plane guy. Chime in if you guys have any corrections on that. But basically, the big guns are coming in, and the target is going to take D3 additional pin markers here, and it will receive a 4-inch high-explosive template, which is, of course, the heavy howitzer template, one of the biggest profiles in the game. Of course, infantry units can go down. It's going to confer a plus 4 penetration value, but always hitting top armor vehicles is going to give you plus 5, hitting the same as a medium anti-tank gun plus six if your vehicle is open topped and that is going to be glancing a heavy tank on a roll of five and penetrating on a roll of six glancing medium armor on four penetrating on five or six light armor glance on three penetrating on four or five over pen on six and then tank ads on a two it's going to be a glancing hits and on a five or six it's going to be over pen uh you're getting vaporized if you get hit by this as a tank at it's just uh c'est la vie so yeah, based on this warplane chart, you're pretty much getting a big bulk fire of a 2d6 machine gun shots at plus two pen value, which is actually extremely good against veteran infantry, soft skin vehicles, and things of the like. Uh, or you're getting a medium howitzer or heavy howitzer attack, plus a little six inch area of pins, which is, you know, pretty impressive if you roll good. And you know the hardest part about those howitzers for most of the game is actually landing a hit because usually there's hit modifiers. So um, yeah, just having to rely on your plane come in actually works out pretty good. Now the downside is that obviously all of this stuff can hit your own guys. So you could argue that you're making a gambit here and trading that two hit for a riskier auto hit where it might bounce back and hit you instead. But combine that with the fact that once a unit has the airstrike marker on it, it can't shake it. And you just have a mechanic that takes away player interaction and takes away them having control over what happens on the tabletop. Oh, but there's another layer to airstrikes that I have not yet mentioned yet. And that is the fact that you do actually have the potential to shoot down these incoming planes before they even strike. 
That's right, most auto cannons or pintle mounted machine guns in this game are actually going to have the flak keyword, allowing them to target incoming airstrikes and potentially shoot them out of the skies. Now, you may or may not notice this, but with uh, bolt action static vehicle scaling, this is going to usually cost you an additional five points. In fact, some medium machine gun teams can actually get a special tripod that lets them get the flak keyword for plus five points which is honestly just a terrible waste of five points on top of a unit that's already a terrible waste of points. So uh, yeah, but let's take a look at how the flak keyword interacts here. So first of all, all units with flak are going to shoot at this incoming attack. It does not matter what team they're on. They all shoot their flak, be it friendly units at your own airstrike or enemy. Now, technically, they're supposed to be within firing arc and range of the targeted units of said airstrike. Now, friendly units, if you don't want them to shoot your own plane, need to check and take a test to see if they can hold fire. With inexperienced units holding fire on a roll of 4+, regular at 3+, and veterans at 2+. Now, obviously, if you're the enemy defending from an incoming plane, you can open fire without making any tests. Now, all units will hit said aircraft on a roll of 5 or 6, with the only hit modifier coming into play being pin markers. So, if you have one pin, it'll be a 6 instead of a 5, and anything past that's going to be double 6. And each successful hit is simply going to count as a pin marker on the aircraft. Now, if your flak weapon is a high explosive, it is instead going to apply D3 hits or pins onto that aircraft instead of just one. And if the plane has three or more hits on it, it counts as being either shot down or scared off, and the airstrike no longer comes into play. Now, what happens if you get a rookie pilot and the plane's coming in on your friendly units? Do they have to test to hold fire? Uh, do the enemies choose whether to shoot at them or not? Well, it's not really explained. And if the flak system alone sounds more complicated than the rest of the airstrike, let alone most combat in bolt action, that's because uh, it kind of is. It's honestly just terrible. This is awful. Awful rules writing. There's just no way around it, and I cannot hide my contempt for it. The game grinds to an utter screeching halt when anyone calls in an airstrike. Then you're bouncing back and forth between casino mechanics and consulting charts. Then you and your opponent are checking to see what units of yours have flak. Then your units are measuring and then rolling to see if they hold fire. Then your opponent is measuring and then rolling to see if they get any hits. Then your airplane, which may or may not come in on be it your target or your enemy's target, will then proceed to roll pins and damage. Again, potentially on your own units. And then, voila, one of the most important plays of the game has been made outside of the tabletop with a unit that does not exist, all during a horrendously clunky transition between checking your rulebook, charts, roles, checking your unit list to see what kind of keywords you have, and then resolving splash effects and then damage. This is, without a doubt, probably my least favorite rule in any war game ever. This is what I go to and what I think of when I think of poorly written wargaming rules. And I really want to emphasize how big of an effect this airstrike will have on the battlefield. Just about every game I've played in bolt action where I've seen a forward air observer come into play, it has been the deciding factor of the game. Be it deleting a medium tank from the you know core pillar of your reinforced platoon, to getting rookie pilot having it come in and then destroy your own tank, and then just have your enemy steamroll you. It's decided probably, I played maybe four or five games with Air Observers, and it's decided like four or five of them. This whole slew of stopping the game and rolling and looking at the rule book has just decided games. And even when I'm on the winning side and my opponent has a rookie pilot come in and blow up his own Sherman, then it's just, I didn't win that game. The rookie pilot did. It's, it's a fluke. You just want to stop and start over. It doesn't create one of those wild, funny, feels-good game moments where it's like a story that's going to last forever. You know, if an artillery barrage drifts into your enemy's lines, that's somewhat memorable. It's chance. And for God's sake, at the very least, it's positioning on the board. And when compared to artillery units, uh, okay, an off-field barrage coming in, yeah, it doesn't feel great. You have non-existent models being represented on the tabletop doing damage and affecting the game. Uh, but you can get artillery in the game. You can get light, medium, and heavy howitzers on the field in bolt action. 
You can't get planes in bolt action. And guess what? World War II people, they tend to really like some of those airplanes. They're pretty cool. There's an absolutely awesome photo on page 87 of the bolt action second edition rulebook of a plane coming in and strafing a little convoy. And wow, does that include so much more imagination than the actual rules here. And for those people who do play forward air observers and they actually have a model plane they painted up and will put on the battlefield as a marker, hats off to them. You're trying to make this a lot more interactive, uh, thematic, and entertaining. I appreciate that. I really do. Because people, they love their Stukas. They love their Spitfires. They want that on the tabletop. And I don't think it'd be impossible to write rules for flyers in this game. I'm pretty sure some people out there already have. I think there's a, a famous one that was written a while back. Um, and we thought we were going to get it with Bolt Action Korea, but it kind of it was more just token mechanics. Not exciting. I think if Warlord used Bolt Action Korea to test out helicopters and uh, some flyer mechanics in the game and rules, I think that would have gone really good for Bolt Action Korea. And maybe ushered in Bolt Action Vietnam too, but they kind of seemed like they weren't bothered with it, which is, yeah, that's really disappointing, honestly. Oh, and by the way, uh, the Americans have a national characteristic where your forward air observer can call in two airstrikes a game just to really smear it on you. Um, that's probably the only time you're actually going to see someone field an air observer. It's going to be people experimenting with that American national trait. But most um, non-sociopathic people will realize that it's a feels-bad mechanic and stop using it. If they're not, then give them one or two rookie pilots, and then they'll probably stop using it altogether. It's all around just not not great. So overall, I again want to emphasize that I do really love Bolt Action's rules. This is the pinnacle of how bad it can be. Not just in Bolt Action, but in Wargaming in general. This, to me, is just the pinnacle of how not to write rules 101. Um, yeah, it's not a, a unit that's you know a core pillar of Bolt Action. It's not something that's going to come up very often. And I think that's kind of why it is written the way it is. But it's, it's terrible. It's just terrible. There's no way around it. I love Warlord games. I love Bolt Action. They have a nice tight rule set. This is the sloppiest thing there. And my big, big wish for 3rd edition is that they add flyers into the game. They don't have to be good. Guys, you can be like Games Workshop. You can introduce flyers, and you can make them suck. So no one takes them anyways. But at least the people who want to have their Stukas can run them, and the rest of us don't have to suffer. I've messed around with the idea of having flyers in bolt action and writing down some rules, and it's not that complicated. Okay, balancing them? Yeah, maybe so. But like I said, if you're really worried about that, just make them not that good. But even if they're terrible, just having that model on the tabletop be an actual unit in your list and represented is just so much better than what we have now. But let me know what you guys think about the forward air observer in the comment section below. I very obviously have strong opinions about this. Like I said in the previous video, I personally think that the artillery observer is a lot better uh, implemented. And even that unit I'm not gung-ho on, but uh, yeah, let me know. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and leave a like. Consider subscribing to the channel. And stay tuned. I think I'm going to do some uh, Warhammer 10th edition talk. Just my general views on the edition so far coming up soon. Um, yeah, let me know what else you guys want to see, because right now it's kind of an open bookend on content. But until next time, as always, take care.